Let's stand up and begin our time of worship together with a song. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died praise the Father of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death the church came from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father. Good morning and welcome to Lakeside. Um, we're a campus of Lima Methodist Church. Glad to see everybody here this morning. Um, we have some faces that haven't been in a while, so good to see y'all back. Um, we have a couple that's part of our Rebel Regiment that won state and a national competition this year. So we welcome we welcome y'all back after that busy season. So. Um, also, um, before I move into the announcements, um, there is a special day tomorrow called Veterans Day. So, do we have any veterans with us this morning? Just, just King James there. So, thank you for your service. If you see a veteran, please 
thank them tomorrow. Um, ultimately, Christ is our major freedom, but it's because of those men and women that serve that we also have our additional freedoms that we have in the United States. And that can be a big, big sacrifice on their part. So thank you. All right, announcements. Kids Life, if you have any kids, Kids Life is this afternoon at 4.30 at the downtown campus. Come have fun. There's also a parenting seminar going on at the same time as Kids Life, so if you want to join the Parenting with Confidence, um, you're welcome to come um, join that, and they will have dinner afterwards, so you get out of cooking too. Our new member classes, if you're interested, it's not too late. Um, we're having those classes at the downtown campus at 2 p.m. So we started last week, so you haven't missed a lot. If you want to come on down and join us, I'll be glad to have you there. Ways to serve. So we still need assistance. Um, there's multiple ways you can serve. Um, if you get here and it's all set up like this, it doesn't happen by magic. It doesn't just suddenly appear. So we can always use help with setup, chairs, altar table, pulpit, tech with the projectors, um, sound. Sound is a little more intense training, but if you're interested in that, we can train you in that too. So. Um, if you're interested in helping us in any way, please let myself or um, if you want to email Andrew, you can do that. But it would probably be easier if you just email me because I'm helping to coordinate some of that in Andrew's absence. And we are welcoming Mr. John Power today. If you were here when he spoke with us a few weeks ago, he is going to be our interim campus director while um, Andrew and Stacy are away for a while. Um, so he wanted you to have his cell number um, if you need anything. So take a picture, put it in your contacts. Um, he's being very generous of his time because he works full time at, um, they call it SWU. Southern Wesleyan University, if you don't know what SWU stands for. So, um, but we thank him for being here and willing to lead us. Okay, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come today just, just in all, in all of the freedoms that we have due to the men and women who sacrificed and served our country, but ultimately, God, our freedom lies in you and in the resurrection of Jesus. As we've been going through this series of all things new, the end result is you are our hope. And you are our lives. And we just want to worship you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand one more time. Sing, Take My Life and Let It Be. my life and let it be consecrated Lord to thee take my moments and my days let them flow in ceaseless praise take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee take my voice and let me sing always only for my king Take my lips and let them be filled with messages for thee. Take my life and let it be. Con 
consecrated Lord to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. As we continue to worship, let's give back our tithes and offerings. the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are the days of great child, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the day. Crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's the year of the year. Out of Zion, still salvation comes. And these are the days of his. The dry bones become meat and flesh. And these are the days of your servant David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest. All the fields are as wide as the world. We are the If y'all will come up for a children's moment here. Judson, you're not coming up? Come on, Jay. Come on. Don't make Anna Claire be up here by herself. <laughs> That's okay, Anna Claire. We'll do it without those boys. How about that? We're good? All right. Do you want to sit or stand? Sit. Good. All right. Do you have a superhero? You don't have a superhero? I bet those boys back there have a superhero. Do y'all have a superhero? No? Well, what do superheroes do? Do we know that? They kind of swoop in and save the day, right? Isn't that what superheroes do in the movies? Superman? They kind of come in and save the day. But you know what? There's somebody bigger and better than any superhero that we see on TV or in movies. You know who that is? God. That's right, Anna Claire. And Jesus, he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And our message today is going to tell us about when Jesus comes back and he defeats Satan and all the evil in the world. And then we will have a new earth. So when that happens... Whose side do you want to be on? God's, that's right. We want to be there on God's side. So how do you think 
We need to live now to be on God's side so that we'll be ready when he comes back to triumph over evil. What's some of the things you do? Help people. That's right. We do help people. That's one of the things that Jesus taught us to do, right? When he was on earth, we also have to obey the commands in the Bible, you think? Yes, ma'am. And we have to ask Jesus into our hearts and read our Bibles and also pray, right? Yeah, pray is very powerful. Praying is our time that we get to talk to God and tell him everything that's on our heart. And you know what? Even if sometimes you're kind of angry, God will listen to that too. Did you know that? Because he's an all-powerful, all-knowing God, right? Okay, let's say our prayer right quick. God, we thank you that Jesus told us that he would come back. And in that time when he comes, he will enter in on his white horse and he will triumph over evil. And God, we just want you to lead us to stay in your word and in your ways, and in your will, so that when Jesus returns, we're on his side. Amen. All right, you want to help me lead the Apostles' Creed? Yeah, okay. Let's tell everybody to stand up. Can you tell them to stand up? (laughs) She didn't want to tell y'all to stand up. Okay, let's um, recite what we believe together as um, believers in... God with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He had ascended into heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we come together um, to our moment of prayer, um, I just want to take just a minute um, just to point out that we have some ongoing illnesses in our Lake family here, so please continue to remember those in your prayer. They're on your bulletin also as far as Neil and Betty, um, and then um, Mary Driscoll's mom also had a stroke this week, so keep her and her family in your prayers also. Um, Those are the two new things I've I've become aware of. Um, And typically we don't call those out, but Neil and Betty's um, had an ongoing um, health challenges. And so we just want to be sure we lift them up in our prayers as well as um, the Sizemore family. So let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just come to you. We may be coming to you with heavy hearts this morning. Over friends, family, that are facing health challenges. And Father, we just know that your healing power is the almighty healing power. And we just ask that your healing power be upon those that we the few that we named this morning, and there are multiple others around the lake and in our church that just just need your power and your strength, God, to get through those health challenges and obstacles. There may be other things that people are bringing on their hearts today. There may be grief. There may be financial stress. There may be still stress from cleaning up after the hurricane. 
I don't know it all, Father, but I know you know it all. And I know that you will reach out and touch the hearts of those who, who need to feel you with them through those trials and challenges. But also, Father, I just pray that for these few minutes that we're together worshiping you, that we can just give it all up to you. And that we can give you the praise and the glory that you deserve. I lift up John as he comes to us today to deliver us the message. And Father, I just thank you for working in his life to bring him to the Lakeside campus, to fill in as our interim director. I just pray for his guidance and leadership for us. Now, Father, help us to pray together as your children, as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we'll have our first reading of the scriptures. The coming of the Son of Man. Immediately after the suffering of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Our second scripture reading comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war with justice. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come to you ready to receive the food of your word. Lord, left to ourselves, we are hungry and wandering 
in the desert like the Israelites. But when you speak, and when we hear from you, we receive manna from heaven. Your word, your wisdom, your life, your ways. Bless us now, Lord, as we tune in, as we listen to what you have to say. We ask for the Spirit to make us aware of your presence. And we pray that Christ would be exalted. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. I am convinced that we do not think often enough about the second coming of Christ. All right, so I'm getting some nods, so it looks like I'm not the only one in the room. It's good to know. I'm convinced we don't think often enough about it. Now, I think that we think about a lot of really important doctrines pretty frequently. I mean, we think about God as the creator, the maker of all things. We think of, uh, about humans being made in the image of God, and uh, as well as uh, being sinners who need forgiveness. We think about many of the attributes of God, his uh, power, his wisdom, his goodness. We, we think on all these different biblical doctrines, and we even think about uh, doctrines that are centered on Jesus, right? We think about, I mean, we, we're about to spend a whole season thinking just about Jesus' incarnation, right? Just about his birth. And then uh, after a while after that, we'll think, have spent a whole season thinking about his death and resurrection. And yet we don't spend a lot of time thinking about his second coming. We don't think about that phrase that we all just recited a few minutes ago, that he will come again to judge the quick and the dead, or the living and the dead. Quick being an old King James kind of word, which is totally fine. The living and the dead. He, he, he comes to judge the living and the dead. We, we recite it, but I think we just don't think about it very often. So, I think by you know, failing to do that, I think we're really missing out. And my hope is that by the end of this message, I will have convinced you of that if you're not already convinced and hopefully given you some resources, some tools to, to be able to do more of that and especially to see the need that you have, that each of us have to think about a second coming. And to get there, I'm going to start in kind of a weird place, all right? Brace yourselves. Uh, the 1987 NFL player uh, protest, all right? The NFL Players Association went on strike in 1987. As my kids would say, trust, right? Trust. It's going to make sense, all right? 1987, uh, the NFL Players Association went on strike for 24 days. It came about as a labor dispute. The owners uh, did not uh, want to uh, increase players' benefits. They did not want to uh, share mu uh, very much of the revenue with the Players Association. There was a collective bargaining agreement. It expired. The players were like, see ya. So they go on strike. And maybe uh, there have been movies made about the replacements uh, that were put on the field. Uh, apparently, the nickname that was given these kinds of players is Scabs, which is super gross. But... Um, they, and the ratings were terrible as a result, and you know, there was widespread protest uh, in public. People just didn't like it. But he, here's, all right, we're getting there. Trust me. The, the owners, they got to a point where they made this public statement. They said, we believe we have made a fair offer. We believe this is a fair deal that we've offered to the players. And what happened is the media picked up on that phrase, a fair deal, and it gets repeated throughout the various media outlets. The public begins to hear this, and suddenly the owners have won the PR war. They have won the public relations battle because now they are seen as fair. They're the reasonable ones. The players who are still holding out, they, they, they're not fair. The owners are fair. Ultimately, the players come back after 24 days. They didn't quite get all the, the things they were hoping for. But the, the point is, the reason they felt pressure to go back, as one opinion would have it, one interpretation of events, would say that it was because they felt the pressure. 
to, to not look like the ones who were unfair. All right. Hopefully I've set it up well enough so you see where I'm going. Fairness, this is a deep human value. We really, really care about fairness. And so when the NFL owners latched on, when they used that word fair and they latched onto it, the media latched onto it, they tapped into this desire that all humans have. And, and then, of course, here, here was the kind of ironic thing. All along, the players wanted the owners to uh, open up their financial books. They wanted to make it publicly known. You know, what's coming in? What's the profit margin? All these kind of things. For those of you who understand financial books. Um, but they wouldn't do it. So when they said, it, we believe we've given a fair deal, well, here's the thing. If it was really a fair deal, why didn't they make the books known? Why didn't they find some appropriate, appropriate way to make the books? Now, look, you can see that it's fair. But they didn't. And so we're left wondering, was it actually fair? Humans have this deep desire for fairness. I mean, just think about how early you see children protest against things that aren't fair. I think even before they have words, <laughs> you know? Or, or how, how, many, how many monopoly boards have been upended <laughs> because somebody said that's not fair? Or, or video game controller slammed on the ground. I never did that, I promise. <laughs> it's not fair. It's not, we have this deep desire for fairness. I wasn't naming any names of any of my children. <laughs> we know that we have this desire for fairness, or the word we usually use for this, like big philosophical word is justice. We want justice. We want things to be right. And when we experience injustice or unfairness, it's discouraging, it's frustrating. We have all kinds of emotional reactions to it. Anger, a, a feeling of hopelessness, a feeling of helplessness. How many times have you had a friend spread rumors about you, someone you thought was a friend, and you never had the chance to you know, tell your side of the story? Or, or maybe you've been in a job where you were passed over for a promotion that you deserved and that person didn't. Or, or maybe it's looking on a broad societal scale and seeing you know, people who never have the opportunity, let's say, to, to, to get uh, fair housing or, or uh, any of the number of injustices that we see on a wide scale. We see those things and we have a feeling of, that's not fair. And what happens is we end up closing our eyes in despair instead of opening our eyes in the hope that we can find in Christ, but specifically at his second coming. Because we think about all those other aspects of Jesus at his birth and his sinless life and his sacrificial death on the cross and his victorious resurrection, but what we don't think is very often about is this ultimate victory that comes when he returns. And so here's what I want us to do this morning. Instead of closing our eyes in despair, I want us to learn how to open our eyes with hope. Why? For two reasons. First, because the second coming of Christ is guaranteed. It's guaranteed. Say that word with me. Guaranteed. Look at our passage, the very first phrase in verse 11 of chapter 19. Then I saw heaven opened. That one word, saw. See, the whole book of Revelation, if you've ever spent any time studying it, and I know there's all kinds of interesting things in Revelation that we don't quite understand, <laughs> but if you go back to the beginning of it, listen to verse 9 of chapter 1. I, John, John the Apostle, not me, uh, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos. You've heard this before. He's, he's uh, been exiled to the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus because of his preaching of the gospel. On the Lord's day, the first day of the week, Sunday, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll, this is what it says, 
Write on a scroll what you see. So that's verse 9 of chapter 1 all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. It's a series of visions. It's the things that he saw. And the whole point was to give him a crystal clear picture of what will happen at the end. And the fact that he wrote it, friends, is for us sitting right here 2,000 years later and every Christian since then to have the opportunity for hope because Christ's return is guaranteed. This wasn't a dream that John had. It was a vision. I don't understand how that works, okay? So, I mean, you can ask me, but I'm just going to shrug my shoulders like this. Maybe I'll speculate a little bit. But somehow he saw something with his physical eyes that is, that is going to happen. It has not happened yet. It's going to happen in the future. Christ will return. And as a result... Christians ever since then have the opportunity to have hope. Because it's guaranteed. Christ will return. And it's just up to us to have enough faith to believe it. And for that to begin to change us from the inside out. To take us from looking down in despair with our eyes closed and looking up in hope to see what John saw. It's guaranteed. But there's a second reason that we can look up with our eyes open with hope. It's because the second coming of Christ is glorious. Say it with me. Glorious. glorious. It's guaranteed and it's glorious. And that, friends, if I, if I just now just sort of unpack the word saw in verse 11, the rest of the message is the rest of this passage. <laughs> Because as I spent time looking at it this week, I realized this whole thing is about what John saw. And what John saw, what does he see? Look at it. Heaven opened. Whoa. Heaven opened. Something, a, 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 it's a real place. People have, have been to space. They've been through our atmosphere. So we know it's not just like above us. And yet, heaven is a real place. Is it, is it another dimension of reality? I have no idea. But it's a real place because it opens and John sees something. A rider on a white horse. And then the rest of this passage, he, uh, I, I thought about having a 19-point sermon, <laughs> but... I realized that probably wouldn't be very helpful, but I, in just spending time in this passage, I saw at least 19 characteristics, qualities of Christ, y'all, at his second coming. That's the whole point I'm trying to get. This is, we can look at Jesus, you know, Matthew 11, where he says, come to me, all you who are weary and labor heavy laden, and I will give you peace. We can look at Jesus as he is then, but Jesus at his second coming is, a, is another side of Jesus. I, I want to, okay, so instead of, instead of 19 sub points here, let me give you four headings, four banners, if you will. All right? Transcendent, good, powerful, supreme. All right? Transcendent, good, powerful, Supreme. First transcendent. John sees heaven opened. All right? This is something bigger and more glorious than just what we see with our eyes. Beautiful lake, the trees. We can see this, but there's this transcendent reality of heaven. And the one who comes out is this rider on a white horse who, um, again, sticking with this theme of transcendent, if you then look um, in verse 13... He's called the Word of God. <laughs> At creation, God speaks a word, and what happens? All things come into existence. <laughs> okay. At the incarnation, God speaks, and the Word of God dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. 
And then at the second coming, God speaks and we see Jesus, the rider on the white horse. These are, these are just these big transcendent realities. And then there's this other phrase under this banner of transcendent in verse 12. He, look at it. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. In, the, in our context, we don't usually think of this category that the, the folks in the ancient Near East had, which is, if you know someone's name, you're, you have the ability to exercise a kind of power over them. He doesn't reveal this name, <laughs> which is pointing to this reality that no one has power over him. Transcendent. Second banner, good. All right, you see them just kind of bouncing around through this passage, trying to not preach a 19 sub point. <laughs> the second banner is good, and this is where I'm just trying to capture a few of the qualities that are mentioned about Jesus. Verse 11, it, it, its rider, the rider on the horse, is called faithful. He does all that God has promised. And true, meaning we need never doubt that he is who he says he is. Nor should we doubt that he will do what he has promised to do. He's faithful and true. He will do it. He will do it. The end of verse 11, it says, he judges and makes war with justice. See, there's, there's our word, justice, fairness. Whatever he does, he does it with fairness, with justice. Have you ever seen uh, a statue of Lady Justice? Sometimes in front of courtrooms, courthouses. She's holding, usually holding a scale that's perfectly balanced. Because that's the goal. All right, go back to the NFL players' strike. We don't know. Was it actually balanced? <laughs> we'll never know because the, the owners didn't open up their books. Jesus always executes justice with fairness. No one will ever accuse him of being unfair or unjust. There will no be, you know, there will never be a, a cosmic upending of the monopoly board, you know, in frustration. Jesus, that wasn't fair. It never happened because he's good. Transcendent, good, the third banner, powerful. This, I just... This is like most of the things you see here in the passage. Okay, a white horse. White indicating both uh, purity as well as certain victory. And then, of course, he's, he's seated on it. He, you know, if you're just standing and someone's seated on a horse, they're above you. He is, uh, uh, yeah, he, he's, Jesus is the rider, the one mounted on the horse. Um, it says, that he, okay, end of verse 11, he judges and he makes war. Those are two distinct things, right? Uh, a, a, a judge and a general in the army are, you know, those, those are two distinct roles. But he does both. And again, he does this as, as one who is good with fairness, with justice, with faithfulness, with truth. And so you just see all these attributes coming together he judges and makes war. And his, his, beginning of verse 12, his eyes were like a fiery flame. You can take this symbolism a couple different ways, but I think what this indicates is that there's no darkness when he looks uh, out. In other words, he sees all. Then there's this phrase in verse 13, he wore a robe dipped in blood. Some take this to mean his, his own blood, but I think when you look in the whole context of, of the war, the battle imagery, especially uh, the one phrase about uh, the wine press, we'll get to it in a minute, um, it's, it, it's clear that this is a sign of his victory over his enemies. In power. He's followed by the armies of heaven, verse 14. They are riding on white horses. They are wearing pure white linen. The purity, the, the cleansing that has come as a result of the work of the one riding on the horse. A, a sharp sword comes from his mouth. If, you know, again, if you, if you try to picture this literally, it's, it's a pretty wacky kind of image, right? How does he talk? <laughs> um, 
and how does he not, you know, cut his lips, whatever. Um, the point is, the, the sharp sword that comes and strikes the nations, it says, it's, it's his words, his words, his pronouncements, whatever he says which are true and right, this is how he judges the nations. By proclaiming their rebellion against him is wrong and that only allegiance to him is right. In verse 13. Sorry, I, this is the, the challenge about bouncing around is I lose my place. There it is. It was on the next page. Um, he rules them with an iron rod, or some translations say he shepherds them. In other words, the image is of like a shepherd's staff, but it's made of iron, indicating his uh, ability to both um, stop any rebellion against him. There's, there's no chance. But also, it's a reminder of Psalm 2, which I'd encourage you to go and read that later today, where it talks about um, the nations trying in vain to succeed against the Lord. And then there's this phrase at the end of verse 15. He tramples the winepress of the fierce anger of God the Almighty. All right, we don't have a lot of time. But here is my understanding of this phrase. If you think about a winepress for a farmer, a, a vineyard owner, this represents the, the final product, right? Right? All of his labor over the course of the whole year to have a, a good crop. By the time the grapes get into the wine press and they're pressed out and made into wine, which in that context was used for both for hydration and for medicine, as well as uh, wine gladdens the heart. It was used for celebration. The point is, it's, this, it's the final product. And I, I think that imagery fits with everything else we see here, which is the finality, the decisiveness of what Jesus accomplishes. The final banner is then supreme. Two, two phrases under this. First, in verse 12, many crowns on his head. You know, don't picture this like unwieldy stack of crowns sort of all. He's kind of balancing them on his head. It, it means he's got them all. There's no authority, no king, no ruler on earth that in his presence can keep their crown on their heads. He has them all. And then it, as if we needed any further explanation, the end of verse 16, the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Every king, every lord, every ruler must answer to him. So friends, as we come to the end of our message this morning, two reasons that we shouldn't close our eyes in despair, but that we should look up with hope. And it's because Jesus' second coming is guaranteed and glorious. We all know there are countless temptations that would lead us to despair. I mean, just think, actually do this. Think about your own life. Think about anything in this past week, month, year, that you have felt that resistance in yourself where you're going, that's not fair. It's not right. It's unjust. And it can be anything from, again, something on the personal level, like missing out on a job promotion or a friend betraying you, all the way to one of those realities that makes us so perplexed. It's a friend or loved one getting very ill. That's not fair. A young person especially, we, we, really, we really feel it then. Or you just think on a, on a large scale, the unfairness we see where, where you know, powerful nations waging war against vulnerable nations. Or the reality that more than 13,000 children die every day of treatable diseases. I mean, it's just, you just feel that sense. It's just not fair. So what do we do? I want to suggest to you as we close three habits to develop. Look, lament, and love. All right, so that you're going to remember them 
Say them with me. Look, lament, and love. Look, lament, and love. First look. It's look at this passage. I know there's roughly 10,000 questions about Jesus' second coming that I didn't go anywhere near, but what I wanted to do today was just look at the, the, the he in he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Look at this picture. Spend time on it. Memorize it. Think about it. Get commentaries. See what all the different phrases are about. When you do this, friends, this is what gives you hope that all the wrong things will be made right. That all unfairness, all injustice will be defeated by the King of kings and Lord of lords. So look at Jesus as he's seen at his second coming. Look and then lament. Okay, maybe this one's a surprise. Maybe you weren't expecting this one. And in fact, I think that the, the practice of lament is something that Christians, uh, in my experience, often haven't been taught uh, on very much. Um, I, I was not really, uh, I mean, it's, it's really been only in the last few years of my Christian life, I've been in the church since I was a child, that I've really heard very much about lament, and I'm super thankful to have heard because the, the tool that this is for your spiritual growth and health is just, it's unmatched. And if, if you want uh, proof that this should be like a normal part of your life, Somebody tell me how many psalms there are in the Bible. How many psalms? The book of Psalms. 150. Didn't know you were going to get quizzed on your Bible trivia. Be ready next time. Um, sorry. This is the last Sunday I was here, right? The guy quizzed us. Get him out of here. 150. One third whatever the number is, somebody do the math. One third of those psalms, Ava said it, is lament. Lament. How long, O Lord? That's how the lament usually says. How long will you forget me forever? I'd encourage you, okay, if you want one psalm of lament that's short and that is a good exercise, Psalm 13. Psalm 13, I strongly encourage you to know that one well. Psalm 13, I love this definition. If you, if you want to know what l- biblical lament is, Mark Vrogop has written a book that's, uh, that talks about this, and here's his definition. It's a prayer in pain that leads to trust. A prayer in pain that leads to trust. Use that as a, a habit that you develop when you feel the unfairness as you look to Jesus, and then third, love. Okay, and I actually mean something very specific. If if you've got a Bible handy, or you've got your Bible app open, look with me at 2 Timothy 4, and this is where we're going to end. 2 Timothy 4, there's this really fascinating phrase in here that if you've read it before, it's, it's very easy to just breeze by right past it. Paul is here at the end of his life and ministry, and he writes to his, the, his friend, his, the person he's mentored, Timothy, and he says, starting in verse 6 of 2 Timothy 4, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure is close. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. Pause. Okay, we expect that from Paul. Yeah, man, was he faithful. Man, did he run the race, fight the fight. The fight. Uh, incredible. The Lord will award that crown to me on that day, but listen, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. And he says it in such a way that that is meant to characterize the whole life of a Christian, among other things, that we would be people who, notice the verb tense, have loved, you know, this ongoing thing. I've always loved the thought of the appearing of Jesus. And if you're here this morning and you don't feel any sense of love for that appearing, I haven't met everybody yet. I don't know where everybody's at spiritually. But I would invite you to consider 
that if you don't feel a sense of love when you see what we've seen about Jesus at his second coming, that's the indication to you. That's the flashing light on the dashboard. I need to figure this out. I need to turn to Jesus, put my faith in Jesus, seek Jesus, and, and, I, and so that my heart is filled with love, thinking about that appearing. Because like I said, when you get a glimpse of the greatness of Jesus at his second coming, it's then that you find hope and how to live right now. Let's pray. Teach us, Lord. Help us to look to this picture of Jesus. Teach us how to lament the brokenness of the world, the unfairness, the injustice, wherever we see it. And help us to become people who love, who love the thought of your appearing, who love the thought of your return, because it will mean that all the sad things will finally come untrue. And I pray, Lord, for anyone here this morning who doesn't feel that love. I pray you would put a spark in their heart right now that would propel them towards Jesus, this one who is transcendent and good and powerful and supreme. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Let's stand one more time. Sing together, There is a King. There is a King Seated among us Let every heart Receive Him now Where there is praise he will inhabit There will be grace Mercy all around Every bird Will be lifted in his presence Every trophy Will be laid down at his feet There is a name King above all kings Unto the Lamb Honor and glory Worthy is He Who overcame Buried in shame Risen in power is alive and the stone is rolled away. All thy worship will belong to him forever. Death is come and our Savior holds the keys. There is a name that reigns above all others. Jesus Christ above all kings it won't be long we will behold him and every tear will wipe away we'll be at home the war will be over me, our Savior face to face, and every burden will be lifted in His presence, every trophy will be laid down at His feet, there is a name that reigns above all others, Jesus Christ. Of all.
Above all kings, Jesus Christ, the King above all kings. It's encouraging to be here with you this morning. I just want to reiterate, put my number up there. Uh, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'd love to uh, give you the time and attention that I can uh, between a job and six children. Um, but truly, if nothing else, if, if I can pray for you, uh, if I can encourage you in any way, um, please, please, please reach out. Um, so as we go, let, let us go out with uh, this benediction from God's word. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Let go in his peace.